Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Catherine Behar, and I run the New Media Arts Space Gallery and the New Media Arts Program at Baruch College. Thank you so much for joining us for this semester's New Media Arts Space Visiting Artist Lecture. I am delighted to welcome our Fall 2021 Visiting Artist, Kate Hersry. At the New Media Arts Space, we have been extremely fortunate to work together with Kate to produce a fully virtual solo exhibition, Kate Herzry Inventing Genealogies. As a curator of this exhibition, I initially approached Kate with an invitation to present some of the works from her important series, Transcorianing. It's been a privilege to get to learn more about this body of work and a special joy to see how this exhibition evolved into a natively digital interactive experience. So I hope that you will be able to experience the exhibition yourselves at newmediaartspace.info. It is on view through December 3rd. So this evening, Kate will be sharing a new lecture that walks us through a selection of works that she has created throughout her career and that inform and contextualize the works in uh, Inventing Genealogies. Kate maintains, as I think you will see, a really persistent focus as she deploys media, performance, and social practice to help us confront difficult issues surrounding diasporic transnational identity. And these are issues that are of paramount importance I think today more than ever. Before I introduce Kate, I just want to share a personal note about how this exhibition came to be. So I've known Kate for many, many years, and I have often thought that her work would resound in really profound ways for the Baruch community. This conviction was reinforced for me when in 2018, I had the good fortune to see her exhibition in Berlin, which included works from her Transkorianing project. And when I saw this show, I just knew immediately that I would love to curate this work one day. However, until the global pandemic moved all of our exhibitions online, it really seemed just totally impossible to work across the Atlantic the way that we are now. So this semester seemed like a really perfect opportunity to invite Kate, and I was honored to learn that, in fact, this is the very first time that Transcorianing has been exhibited in New York City. And I just think that it's so fitting that we're able to um, present this work through Baruch College. One of the pieces that most stuck with me from the 2018 Berlin exhibition involved the two quotes with which the online exhibition begins. So in Berlin, this memorable piece was powerfully installed in a way that it straddled the demarcation line where the Berlin Wall once stood, which cut through the gallery, dividing east from west. In Inventing Genealogies, viewers are invited to undertake multiple passages from east to west and back again, from west to east and back again, from one nation to another and back again and again. As Kate and I collaborated with the New Media Art Space student docent team to produce this exhibition, the journey of crisscrossing and decision making turned into a choose your own adventure style interactive narrative. And this element of performative decision making is present in so much of Kate's work. And I'm really excited to hear her speak tonight about the decisions that led her to this present exhibition. So before we begin, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. First of all, for our live stream audience, um, I know some of you are already doing this. Um, please go ahead and use the comments box on YouTube to enter any questions or comments that you have. The New Media Art Space team is monitoring, uh, uh, excuse me, moderating the feed. So Kate will speak for um, a little bit under an hour, and then we're going to end with between somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes for Q&A, when we will answer as many of your questions as you can. And I know that we have two classes, um, and that many students have already prepared questions. So thank you so much, and please for feel free to add them to the chat as well as they come to you. So I would also like to take a moment to thank our sponsors and supporters for this event. The event is sponsored by the Sandra K. Wasserman Jewish Studies Center and supported by the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences, the Newman Library, and the Fine and Performing Arts Department at Baruch College. I'd especially like to acknowledge the incredible New Media Arts Space team, Anya Valentine, 
Brian Campana, Yasmin Collins, Millie Encarnacion, and our project manager, Maya Hilbert. So I'm very honored to have you all on screen here um, so that you can receive some recognition and thanks for your superb work. I think that this show, more than any other exhibition we've produced to date, is truly a product of the creativity, intelligence, and remarkable skills of the docent team. And I'm very grateful to all of you for making this exhibition what it is. Lastly, I would like to thank several individuals at Baruch who have personally supported this exhibition and event through their vision and hard work. Interim Dean Jessica Lang and Professor Andrew Sloan, co-directors of the Wasserman Jewish Study Center, Dean Arthur Downing, Chairperson Ann Schwarz, Bu Choi, Amanda Becker, Karina Peskesi, BCTC, and Beth Harpaz. And now finally, I would like to introduce Kate. Transnational feminist Kate Hersvey is an interdisciplinary visual performance and social practice artist who works between Germany, South Korea, and the United States. She has recently shown work at Soma Art Space in Berlin, Mindblau Project Traum in Berlin, the AHL Foundation in New York, the Mia Collective Art in New York, and Museum for Asiatische Kunst in Berlin. A new installation dealing with death ritual and the afterlife will be featured at the Pacific Asia, uh, excuse me, the Pacific Asia Museum at the University of Southern California. And she is currently preparing for a solo exhibition at the Paul Robeson Galleries at Rutgers University. So please join me in welcoming Kate Hersry. Kate, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm really, I have to say, overwhelmed by that introduction. It's so warm and just lovely. And I feel so honored to be here and to present my work and to also be involved with um, Baruch, the new media art space. Um, yeah, so maybe what I'll do, um, I'd like to, well, let me thank Catherine, of course, Catherine Behar for inviting me. And uh, it's been kind of a journey. Uh, we got uh, acquainted so long ago and seeing all the different works that we've developed as artists through the years, it's just really touching to me that now we're working together in this manner. Okay, so I actually wanna just um, jump in right away. Um, my projects, as you know, are research and also quite uh, intensely intuitive uh, work in the studio simultaneously when I do research. Um, often for long periods of time, months or years on a particular, particular project. And uh, I'd like to tell you that those two activities are really informing each other. And so you see that sometimes I have explored unseemingly unconnected topics in my work. But my practice is really um, based on this idea of a self-reflective, very subjective position. And so um, I'd like to first uh, open up the PowerPoint to the title page before I um, begin. Here we go, great. So, <clears throat> so my work I think is um, very much connected to these ideas of displacement and belonging. And it doesn't matter what project I'm working on. I've done a project about how digital technology has affected the way in which um, we practice and consume beauty. I've done a project where I've created um, edible, uh, edible uh, sculptures that mimic or imitate the idea of minimalist objects. Um, or, you know, for example, this piece in which I go through and I recover my South Korean nationality that was stripped from me as a child. Um, all of these works, even though they, they look very different, um, you view them very different because I'm using so many different mediums, but they're all very much firmly, I would say, positioned in this idea of uh, auto-ethnographical narratives. And so the best thing I think is to just jump in and I wanna show you a, a few things from the past 
as well as some things, some very current uh, work and the LLP showing you a selection of the works from the exhibition as well. So uh, let's go to uh, slide two, please, Brian. And thank you very much, Brian, for helping me with all the tech challenges that we had with my work since I'm a, I'm a Mac person. And I know that here we're dealing with the PC. So this piece, I've actually not shown it uh, before in this type of presentation. So I'm really happy to share this with you. This is a work that I did in 1994. And when I calculated uh, the time, I realized that it's 27 years old, which totally blew my mind. Um, not only because of the time that has, you know, flowed since that to time from then to now, but also because I recognize that there is a very steady through line. There is a kind of uh, red thread that you see that flows in the artistic practice. And this piece is the first performative work that I made. And what it is, is it's really dealing with this um, idea of um, how we feel compelled to conform to a white standard of beauty. Um, next slide, number three, please. So the preliminary drawings that I did eventually became a kind of a performance for the camera. And my college roommate helped me make these photographs. And, and you, you see them in the photo in these photographs. I'm wearing a kipe, I think that's what it's called, which is rather not a Korean traditional dress, but a Chinese one that has its tradition in the Manchurian region. And um, so, you know, you might ask, why am I wearing a Chinese dress? I'm not Chinese, but I wasn't actually interested in a specific ethnicity, but actually the racialization of East Asians as the other, as being all the same. And the fact that we are often read as being Chinese. In fact, as a child growing up, um, I thought that, you know, very young child, I thought Chinese was a bad word because of the way that children used to taunt me. So I, you know, had assumed that it was some type of insult. Um, these photos were taken with slide film and they were insta installed as a move, a kind of moving slide animation. So if you can imagine, there were three slide projectors stacked on top of each other on this uh, tower. And then they would, these slides would then dissolve into each other to create a kind of film. And at this time, this was in fact, thought of as being quite, you know, cutting edge technology. Um, now we're going to go to slide four, please. So I'm going to fast forward now to a 2004 intervention and a related film work that I think is quite relevant to framing the exhibition Inventing Genealogies. Uh, this is called the Missing Persons Project. And um, I'll just tell you at the top of this poster, it says actually, looking for this person, which is like the way that the Koreans would use, you know, a missing person's uh, poster. And this was conducted in Seoul um, when I decided to do a search for my birth family. And one of the main ideas was that I wanted to bypass the more traditional ways that adopted Korean people um, would take in order to seek their families, which was typically they would go on some type of, you know, large giant broadcasting um, television show. And uh, usually because it because of the type of viewers that would look at these shows is that the uh, these broadcasting giants would really compel us to um, tell our sort of pity story. Right. So and <clears throat> and I, in fact, in my first year that I had returned to Korea, I had had this experience where I was taken, they were doing a documentary on me actually as an artist, but they surprised me and took me to an orphanage, showed me images of um, these reunion photos of, you know, Korean women who had met their children and they asked me to cry for the camera. And I flatly refused to participate in their pity porn. I was not interested in um, participating in this type of fantasy story that they, they, you know, like to produce for their viewers 
this kind of sad, lost adoptee that returns to the motherland. And so my idea was to, to do something that was much more do it yourself. Um, often adopted Koreans are considered, I mean, even now, I mean, back then for sure, but now we're still considered to be somewhat helpless, um, needy and childlike because we don't understand the language or the culture. And so these particular missing per persons posters of myself, what I did was I we pasted them around the hospital where I was born. It was in the middle of the night, actually on the night of my um, my 30th birthday party. Uh, sorry, it became a party because I had invited all of these friends of mine from the Korean diaspora to help me. And so we plastered this particular neighborhood with many of these posters. And so what I want to do now is show um, the video called Missing or No Chim that was the result of this search. So we're going to go to slide five and we can show the video right away. Yogisa 그들에게는 불암이라고 생각되었습니다. A woman travels to Seoul for the first time since she was saved by American evangelists. A woman stands outside of a hospital. She wonders in which room was she born. Thousands of children have been adopted from Korea and have brought untold joy and delight to countless families. Yours can be one of those fortunate family groups made richer and fuller by the addition of a wonderful small person who will return love in full measure and who will reward kindness and affection with adoration and devotion.
준비하신 말씀 전해주세요. 네. 안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. 음, 제가 미국에서 온 케이트 헐즈입니다. 저는 1976년 4월 3일 동현하 병원, 노, 동현하 산부인과에 태어났습니다. 동현하 산부인과에 태어났습니다. 동현하 산부인과에 태어났습니다. 어, 우리 친부모 음, 哦，我们是有，那那那个，我，很，很平，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，很，
this type of brute force, uh, which means I stopped speaking English for a period of time. I learned to speak fluent broken German in a period of three months. Uh, it was fluent, but it was quite broken, but people understood what I was trying to say. And at this point, my attention really turned, uh, re turned from Korea as a site of production to Germany, which is my current home and residence. And it's also ironically the ethnic root of my adoptive father. And so I want to show you a short uh, excerpt of this a, a very embarrassing evolution of where I could, you know, to speaking fluent German. Uh, it's very cringeworthy, uh, but I think it's kind of an interesting process that you can start to see in the video. So we can go to slide seven and show the video. After learning German for less than a year, an American woman moves to Berlin and refrains from using her native language English and only communicates in German for a period of three months. This is part of her video diary. Ich plane ein dreimonatiges Performance-Projekt über die Beschränkung von Sprache. Ich werde mich weigern, in meiner Muttersprache Englisch zu sprechen und stattdessen nur Deutsch sprechen, was ich erst seit einem Jahr lerne. Ich werde meine E-Mails grundsätzlich nur auf Deutsch beantworten, auch wenn sie auf Englisch an mich gerichtet werden. Ich werde nur deutschsprachiges Radio und deutschsprachige Musik hören, deutsches Fernsehen und deutschsprachige Filme schauen und Bücher, Zeitungen und Magazine in deutscher Sprache lesen. Es ist mir erlaubt, Filme in anderen Sprachen außer Englisch zu sehen, wenn sie entweder deutsch synchronisiert oder mit deutschen Untertiteln sind. Guten Abend, ähm, ich möchte mich ein bisschen vorstellen. Ich heiße Kate Harris und ich bin eine Künstlerin. Ich komme aus Los Angeles und ähm, ich kann jetzt kein Englisch, nur Deutsch sprechen vor äh, drei Monaten. Ähm, es fängt äh, um 6 Uhr an bis ähm, 31, nein, 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 1. Mai um 6 Uhr abends. So, hm. danke viel. Ähm, ich hoffe, dass, ähm, dass Sie äh, können ähm, in meiner Website immer besuchen. Danke. Ciao. Mm, I don't think I turned the the microphone on. Ich habe keine Ahnung, was ich, äh ich muss sagen. Morgen ist ähm, der letzte Tag, äh, den ich nur auf Deutsch sprechen äh, darf. Und dann äh, erste Mai muss ich nur bis 18 Uhr auf Deutsch reden. Und ich hoffe, dass ich etwas äh, Besonderes äh, machen kann in diesem Moment. Aber ich weiß es gar nicht, denn vielleicht das ist, äh, es 
ist eine große Erwartung zu haben. Okay, could we go to slide eight, please? Um, so I want to talk a little about Berlin. And when I moved there to conduct this project, the idea of an Asian person being American at the same time seemed to really floor a lot of Germans that I met and just, you know, catch a lot of Europeans in general by surprise. And I thought it would be educational to maybe put in context um, in terms of how historically Asians have been perceived. And I thought it would be great to look at this image um, that was produced in the late 1880s by a German artist named Hamann Knachfuss, which is a really funny last name. It's like snap, crackle, snap, crackle, pop, feet. <laughs> Um, anyway, so he created this illustration, and this was at the time that Kaiser Wilhelm II was perpetuating the racist stereotype of yellow peril. He didn't coin it. It was coined by a Russian, um, I believe a Russian politician, but he was the one that perpetuated it throughout all of Europe. Um, apparently, he had this dream. This is what the illustration is about. He had a dream um, of Buddha riding a dragon, uh, threatening Europe that they were going to invade and basically the, all of the East Asians would come and enslave the Europeans. So this is kind of, I mean, this was a long time ago, but this is sort of also these historical images that we can look at in the past really inform the ways in which people perceive us today. And so that brings me to the next piece that I would like to introduce to you, which it would be on slide nine. So we can advance to the next work. Um, this is a work called East Meets West. And these are iconic, very iconic images. They're self portraits by the Chinese American artist, Tseng Kuang Chi. Uh, it really explores his this idea of the perpetual foreigner identity in the United States. And this work inspired me to create this next piece that I'll show you that was in direct response to all of these reports that we heard of anti-Asian racism and violence during the COVID pandemic. So let's go to um, the next slide, slide 10, please. So this work is called Wish You Weren't Here. And they are um, selfies per performed in front of somewhat empty tourist sites at really the height of the pandemic uneasiness. Um, they were created, I think, for one week from March 16th to the 22nd to the 22nd. So the borders in the United States had just closed, but mac masks were not mandatory. Um, masks were also not mandatory yet in Germany, but they are very much mandatory now still in public transportation and also in uh, public areas in all the grocery shops and for example, the the drugstores and things like that, they're still mandatory. Um, but at this time in March of 2020, nobody or very few people were, were, married, were wearing masks. And so when I wore a mask, I felt very much like people looked at me like I was a virus. And um, wearing a mask actually made me feel much more visible as an Asian person and much more vulnerable at this time. Um, so, you know, the work was really uh, a kind of, I wouldn't say it was a dangerous performance, but it was certainly like, 
very uh, nerve wracking type of performance that I did in public. And it was included in an online exhibition called the COVID-19 Diaries that was organized and curated by the Mia Collective in New York City. And so I'm going to show you the next work that I did that is an extension of this piece that also really explores the idea of anti-Asian racism during the coronavirus pandemic. And it's called Wish You Weren't Here and I Feel Fine. Um, I'm just going to show then a short excerpt of it so we can go to slide 11 and then show um, the video immediately. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to the next slide, slide 12. And I'm going to talk about specific works now in the genealogies exhibition. And once again, I want to just mention that this was really a work that was done um, with a lot of support from the student docents uh, in the new media art space. And I want to just thank them really for all their boundless creativity and their mad coding skills. Um, I especially want to thank um, Maya Hilbert, who took a lot of time to meet with me personally, um, with Professor Behar, to really talk um, about different types of brainstorming ideas. Um, it was truly a collaborative, collaborative process that happened over several weeks. So thanks again. Um, we're looking right now at a kind of 
calling card or a name card. We can also call them business cards or visiting cards. And these are really, I would call them tools of empowerment that I've used many times in my social interventions. So they, what they do is they really announce my position and they, they quite, you know, they verbalize my intention with the piece. So I see them as instruments of self-agency. And I was inspired by the calling cards of the artist Adrian Piper. And I discovered her when I was a young artist, probably 18, 19 years old. And you can explore more of her work on the artist picks page on the new media, um, the new media art space website. Uh, we're going to go to slide 13, please. And so contracts in that similar way really set out the parameters and the expectations of the performances and lay out the rules of what I'm permitted and, you know, forbidden to do during this time. And the durational work of Taishin Xie was very instrumental for me um, to think about using kind of playing with this idea of contracts for work and his work is also listed on the artist picks page if you're interested check that out uh, go on to please um, slide 14. so from 2016 to 2017 i undertook the major social intervention work um, this durational performance uh, through this idea of brute force um, to become the so-called authentic Korean. Are we on um, slide 14? Oh yeah, we are. Okay. So during the same years um, of my project, Bruce Jenner, you know, became Caitlyn Jenner and Rachel Dolezal was publicly revealed to be a white woman instead of the black activist that she portrayed herself to be. Dolezal claimed that she was transracial, that is, a black woman trapped inside the body of a white woman. And she attempted to equate her experiences to that of a transgender person, much to, um, to much backlash and consternation. And so if you imagine it is with this backdrop that I decided to call my performance transchorionic. Despite obvious differences, I show solidarity with those who transitioned from one gender to a gender presentation to another gender presentation. Um, in addition, these commonly used terms in the LGBTQ community to describe experiences felt very much like they were describing some of my own experiences in terms of these issues of belonging and displacement. I came out to my adoptive family as a Korean. I have felt like a closeted adopted person, ashamed of my story of being abandoned because of my female gender after passing for so long as an orphan saved by Christian missionaries. Can adopted people's ethnic identity be fluid as we evolve? Can we be ethnic queer? And the work was also informed by passionate protests of transracial POCs, those of us adopted across race and ethnicity. And we have all been quite offended by this co-option. This term transracial has been used for decades by activists and academics alike to define and to really talk about our experiences being adopted transracially. And in this project, I reclaim this word transracial from Dolezal's damaging appropriations. Um, we, will, we can go on to the slide 15, please. So I used uh, social media quite a bit in this piece to document my transition forcing myself to only post in Korean, which was super painful and didn't feel authentic at all. And the exhibition I called um, I Like Korea and Korea Likes Me, and it was curated by Kai Jung at the Korean Cultural Center in Berlin. Um, the title is obviously influenced by a 1974 exhibition by the German conceptual artist Josef Beuys. His exhibition was called 
I like America and America likes me. We can go to slide 16, please. So the viewers of the Instagram printouts at the first public presentation that I did in Korea, they were invited to correct all my grammatical mistakes and my spelling errors. And the corrections were included, they're included in the Inventing Genealogies exhibition as part of the appendix. So when you go through the exhibition, you can, you know, you can slide up and swipe up and then you can see them there. Um, so now we can go to slide 17, please. Uh, along with regularly posting to Instagram, um, I made a daily video diary to basically just speak, to just get practice speaking every day. And in the exhibition, um, there is a 15 minute, I think, excerpt that is from a total of 600 um, minutes of video, which, you know, looking through all the video as I was doing this piece, much of it is quite banal. It's quite embarrassing. Um, but I was intensively studying Korean at the language school during the entire process. And I tried to immediately use the vocabulary and grammar that I had, used, that I had learned that day to sometimes quite embarrassing results because I was often not using them correctly. But I was studying like a real Korean. I mean, I was studying four hours a day in the language school. And then I would go home or to the library and then I would study for three hours after that. And I had never studied so hard in my life. Adopted Asian people usually do not have tiger moms. Okay, so let's go to slide 18. Um, the video diary is installed to the right in the exhibition space. And then to the left is a performance work called Korean Face that's, you know, inside of the light box. Could we go to slide 19, please? So um, Korean Face was this sort of social intervention project, and it was performed by me and two other transnationally adopted Korean um, students who I had met at the language school, um, Teo Siegler and Susan LeBoy. Um, Teo was adopted to the United States and Susan was adopted to Europe. And so what we did, did was we rented hanbok, which is the traditional Korean dress. And we then went to um, one of the Korean palaces, famous, a very famous palace called um, uh, Changdeokgung. And um, Susan was so lovely to help me take these photographs. And this these, the, you know, doing this type of a, doing this type of um, kind of activity, renting these hanboks and then going to uh, what, any one of these palaces is quite a, a tourist trap. It's quite popular with foreigners, but you also see a lot of young native Koreans doing this as well because you can get such good photographs for Instagram. So here's my tip. If you're wearing a hanbok and you go to Korea, you can get into all five palaces for free. Okay, so now I'd like to go to slide 20. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about this work called Crossing the Line. Um, Professor Behar spoke about it a little bit. Uh, this is the work that debuted in I Like Korea and Korea Likes Me. And it's really the piece that I think forages the conceptual framing the narrative of inventing genealogies. And so here's a great photograph of the Korean Cultural Center. It's located at Leipziger Platz. Leipziger Platz is right next to Potsdamer Platz for some of you who might know a little bit about Berlin. And this is a very, you know, famous tourist spot because you can actually see remnants of the wall. This is where the wall really cut through the city. And if you stand you know, on this green strip, you can see where the wall went through, you know, the, the building. I mean, the building wasn't there at that time. And if you follow that line into the gallery 
And, you know, I stood inside looking down onto this demarcation. I could really see exactly where that former wall had gone into the building. I mean, the building was new, of course, so where it had existed before. And um, I decided to use that as where I would like to place these pedestals. So we can go now to slide 21. And so on each side of this demarcation, I placed a pedestal um, with these powerful words of Black thinkers, um, one human rights activist, the other a comedian. And both of these quotes really beckon the viewer to engage. These columns are checkpoints. They control my travel and my identity from east to west and west to east. You go to the pedestal and you're, you know, enco you encounter this um, digital tablet that you can swipe, you can swipe through all the bureaucratic documents that were necessary to change my identity from South Korean to US American. And you go to the next one and you see all of the necessary documents that were, um, that I engaged with. Um, chasing this paper trail in order to then recover my citizenship. What's great is I did actually be, get a chance to keep my U.S. citizenship, so I am now a dual citizen. Um, these these columns for me and this checkpoint also call to mind that Korea is still uh, has been separated and exists, um, you know, in exists basically in North as North and South Korea for, it's been like nearly se seven decades. Okay, so the next thing I would like to do is engage in the issue of the perception and representation of Asian women, specifically Korean women in this context. And I want to show um, just a few minutes of the last piece of the exhibition, which is called The Korean. And all the images that you see in the film are taken by white photographers, two European and my American parents. And we can go to slide 22 and then we can show the video immediately. The first image she told me was of an orphan child crying in a field with an infant. She said that for her, it was the image of loss, and she had tried several times to link it to other images, but it never worked. She wrote me, one day I'll have to put it all alone at the beginning of a film with a long piece of black leader. If they don't see loss in the picture, at least they'll see the black. She wrote, I'm just back in South Korea, my birth country. I applied to recover my nationality. On the 11th of January, 2018, I was finally notified that my application was in the last stages of being approved. I've returned to Seoul to finalize the process. The final steps include submitting more supporting documents, including a certificate of relatives, birth certificate, marriage documents, an origin certificate, residence ID, and biometric ID photos. I have the documents, documents, proof, evidence, photograph, signature. One day you raise the right hand and you are American. They give you an American passport, the United States of America. Somewhere, someone has taken my identity and replaced it with their photograph the other one. She liked running around Seoul to various offices to track down the paperwork of her existence. It made her feel like she came from somewhere. She wrote, many of the civil servants are bewildered when I show up to mark my claim to this uneven paper trail. After all, I had left South Korea as a seven-month-old infant.
Every ten feet they demand to know who and what you are, who is represented. The eyes gather toward the appropriate proof, towards the face, and then again to the papers. When did you leave the country? Why did you leave this country? Why are you returning to the country? She used to write to me from Germany. She contrasted the bureaucratic encounters with Koreans with those of the Germans. Both situations could be incredibly stressful for her speaking in broken languages. She said, though, that in Korea she had to explain all her intentions, her desires, and literally her entire life story, and it was humiliating. But the Germans simply didn't care. You return and you are not one of them. They treat you with indifference. All the time you understand what they are saying, but the papers give you away. Every ten feet, they ask you identity. They comment upon your ability or inability to speak, whether you are telling the truth or not about your nationality. She wrote me that she could no longer pass for being a second-generation Korean American as she normally did. She was now outed. She was now a real Korean. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about a certain text that I used in the film, which is from this experimental novel from um, 1982 called Dicte uh, by the Korean American writer, theorist, artist, Teresa Ha Kyung Cha. And I chose specific texts that really spoke to me strongly um, from 1997 when I first read the book. Someone gave me the book when I arrived and I read it and I was completely confused about what the book was about. And I think um, what then is sort of touching to me is, you know, I've, I've revisited this book like many, many times. I've probably read it, you know, like at least I read, I tried to read it like, you know, once every couple of years because it speaks to me in different ways. And I understand a lot more of what she's doing. Um, but my experience reading the book at that time was very bewildering and I was really, really confused. And that paralleled the exact experiences that I had as I returned to Korea for the first time. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about some of the images that I appropriate for the film, specifically the ones that are from Chris Marker. Um, who's a very famous French experimental filmmaker. His images are of um, North Korean women uh, from the 1950s. And I assume that he did, he did not get model releases from them. Um, these women did not give consent to him to be photographed, but he received permission from the male heads of state to photograph the people. And so I think this is, again, another example of men deciding how the bodies of women can be used and regulated. Um, the images are from this book called The Female Koreans, and it's written in the feminine plural. I think it's like a Koreanese or something like that. It's explicitly presenting Korean women. And then hence you see that in my work, the objectified women stare their white gaze back at the viewer. Um, so from my critical lens of transnational feminism, I think I only need to quote Chris Marker to get my point across. Um, he said, quote, in another time, I guess I would have been content with filming girls and cats, but you don't choose your time, end quote. Uh, for me, I still grapple with the ways I can be very moved by an artwork and still um, have a lot of problems with like such objectified forms of female representation. Okay, slide 23, please. I'm going to talk about two pieces from the Korean Cultural Center exhibition. One of them is also presented in the Inventing Genealogies um, exhibition as well. It's Congratulations, which you see on the left. And this is a conceptual work that I also sent 
through the mail to Park Sang-gi, who at that time was the Minister of Justice in Seoul. Um, shortly after I received my nationality, I made this piece. Um, so let's go to the next slide, slide 24, and give you some background information. So when I received the notification that informed me that I was accepted as a true South Korean again, the letter was rather dry and an inspiring bureaucratic jargon, and I was a little disappointed. So I decided to write my own congratulatory letter to celebrate my return. And then I took that letter and then I had everything translated and then I advocated the South Korean government to use it as kind of a, uh, how do you call it, like a um, template, a template for the letter that they could make for all adopted Korean people who end up um, recovering their nationality. But I never got a reply. I'm still waiting, um, but I don't think that they decided to take my suggestion. Okay, so now we're going to look at slide 25, please. Okay, so this piece is um, called Heterogeneous Infiltration for Sogo. It's another reference to Yosef Boys. Um, so I covered this traditional hand drum in this uh, handmade felt that I made. It sort of memorializes, I think, my happy-go-lucky youth and sort of my naivete and optimism about my South Korean identity. Um, but uh, we are brought back to reality um, as it's revealed, you know, when you look at the piece on the wall, um, work caption that the drum inside is actually damaged. And so this work, though, is a precursor to this long-term project that I'm currently working on that looks at object display and the history of collecting. And it's one of those objects that I started to call uh, transcultural artifacts. Um, it's a banal object that then I transform by way of some type of uh, intervention to make it more abstract and ornamental. And I then, through this process, the original usage is then muted. We can go to the next slide, which is slide 26. So um, heterogeneous infiltration for Sogo, it developed into this later work that I made called Di Shamanin, or translated into English is the female shaman. And this soft sculpture is kind of this cultural spiritual being and it ponders the cosmos, um, but it confronts two different, very different, this like two different, very, how do I say, different kinds of um, cultural appropriation from a German side. It's very much entangled with modern German history. So we see on the front, the swastika, and on the other side of the drum, it's a representation of an archeological find called the Nebra Sky Disc. Uh, both are ancient symbols. Um, they're both considered to have religious origins linked to the movement of the sun. And in 19, uh, 1920, Hitler appropriated the swastika. The symbol has, you know, has been around as early as 7,000 years ago, um, which was, it was found in very, in varying places in Eurasia. And in 2010, the state of Saxony-Anhalt, they registered the design of the neighbor sky disk as a trademark, which is very strange because archeological finds and the neighbor sky disk in general is considered an artwork. You are not legally allowed to trademark such a sign, but they were successful. And anytime someone tries to use the disk's likeness, um, they sue them, and they're always quite successful in that. So I was very interested in these sort of two different ways that we can look at cultural appropriation from a kind of German context. Okay, so next we'll go to um, the next slide, slide 27. So I want to leave you with um, this quote that has been really influential on in my practice um, by Grace Lee Boggs, and I'll just read it aloud for you. I have to take off my glasses because I have a hard time reading such small print. 
a revelation, a revolution that is based on the people exercising their creativity in the midst of devastation is one of the greatest historical contributions of humankind. And she is, she was, she, um, she passed away in, um, when she was a hundred years old. She was a author and a philosopher and a civil rights um, leader who I met in Detroit when I was a high school student. And I, since then, have kept in, I had kept in touch with her. And this is a quote that I often go to when I'm not quite sure where my practice is leading me or when I feel um, disempowered, you know, by things that are going around in the world. And I always keep this as my focus when I'm practicing my art. So thank you so much for your kind attention. Kate, thank you so much for uh, a really remarkable lecture and for sharing so many um, details about your work and about um, about so many through lines, really, um, that have like, this, this material has been with you in and out of your art practice your whole life. And I think that that is such a, a remarkable thing to see. Um, so thank you for narrating this for us. Um, I have the difficult task of trying to uh, moderate our conversation now because we have a really, we've gotten some amazing questions. Um, students have sent in questions and then we also have several questions that have been coming through the chat. Um, so I wanna jump right in um, and I have tried to sort of group these. I'm gonna give you, because we have so many, we have a, an abundance <laughs> of questions. So I'm gonna try to group these into, um, into, I'll give you multiple questions that are sort of thematically related and you can speak to whichever part of this um, uh, you see fit. So the first um, question is from, um, this is a two-part one, it's from Judy and Jose. So I thought these sort of uh, reflect on one another. So Judy asks, how would you define cultural identity? Does government documentation such as citizenship, uh, so, excuse me, such as the citizenship letter you received somehow certify your cultural identity? And Jose asks, what role would you say the process of decolonizing has in your work of identity exploration? So I, maybe we'll start with those two. Oh, those are really big questions. They're really great questions. I mean, cultural identity, if I speak about it very personally, it's something that I think becomes, if that, if that makes sense, at least for me in my situation, because I would have probably never identified myself so strongly as, you know, Korean American, or I would even say Asian American as a, as a young adult. I mean, maybe I, I had desired that so much, but so much about my experience about cultural identity has been about these ideas of displacement and belonging. Um, the like feeling compelled to belong somehow right and then always being stuck because in both instances I was never 100% accepted so you know that maybe talks about like do these documents then can they then justify you know my search or can they certify right like who I am and I would say probably the answer would be no um, it was a symbolic gesture. I certainly felt like the search and then the recovery was this challenge for me. I mean, it was one of the most difficult things I did, but I was so determined once I began the project, once I had made the decision to recover, it just I was just so laser focused. It was kind of ridiculous to have that type of fervent, I guess, you know, effort. But it was symbolic because I'm still, I still do not normally sort of 
occupy that space as being a South Korean um, in terms of when I visit, you know, so let me talk about something funny is when I go to South Korea now, it's really complicated because I have like two different names. Like I have two different passports with two different, completely different names. And so people are really confused when I go to, through immigration. And so I have to bring both passports with me because what ends up happening is I fly to South Korea, you know, on my U.S. passport. And that's the name that I have my plane ticket under. So that's, these are the names that they have coming in. But then I get to immigration and then I have to give them the two passports. And not only that, I also have another document that's like a Korean document that I ended up um, receiving from the um, Korean embassy in Berlin that says like this name, you know, my Pak Mide name and then the caterers rename saying that this this is the same person. So it's like really complicated. I have the two passports and then I have this other document that says these are, this is one person. Um, then it's really awkward because, you know, like I'm, I wouldn't say I'm fluent in Korean. My German is so much better than my Korean, but I can get by. But I open my mouth and people obviously are like, oh, this is not a Korean. And then if I go to some type of like place where I have to deal with some like bureaucratic task, then, you know, of course I just use my Korean passport and then I give it to them and we're discussing things and then they're totally confused and they look at me like I'm an alien. And then I have to explain my whole life story. It's actually in some ways having the Korean passport has been like so satisfying but at the same time, it's like a burden. It's become like this burden on me because then I have to like explain to every single stranger like my entire life story. And before, as I, you know, as I spoke about in the film, like I could just pass for being second generation Korean American because my Korean had gotten to the point that it was, it was good enough to then, okay, like, you know, people just think like I was born in the United States and that I just didn't have that much opportunity to speak in Korean. And then the second question, I guess, is how does the process of decolonization play a role in my work? I think that's what the project was about. I mean, actually, um, but the process was very much driven by so much personal angst, I have to say, and maybe not so much about um, like a an outward sort of formula of when we when we talk about for example you know the project that i'm working on right now the one that's about object display and the history of collecting it's really bound up with a lot of the rhetoric about decolonizing the museum right talking about object origins and the provenance and did these large empires have permission to take these objects? Uh, what conditions were the objects taken? I think that there's something really authoritarian or something, you know, like the way that we, not authoritarian, but there's somehow questions that are, that are formulaic and ones that we can discuss, you know, this process of decolonization. But I didn't have any of those considerations at all when I was going through the process of making it. It was really draw it was really driven by more of this personal desire and the self-reflection of what does it mean for me to recover my nationality? Was it what does it mean for me to like take back what I lost, you know, without my permission, like when I was a child. And then after I think during the project, that's when I started to think about formulating or making making more of a political statement with it you know and i think that's another thing is what i'm so always so interested in is is i talk about my work really being positioned in this auto ethnographical narrative meaning for example you you take 
personal experience. You're engaged with things that happen to you, your experiences, and then you connect them to larger social, cultural, or political realms, you know, to, to actually talk about bigger issues. It's like not just about you. It's not just about that one thing. And then I think as I did this social intervention, and it really became about me engaging with Korean public, me engaging with social media, me engaging with other transnationally, you know, adopted Koreans, um, which is really funny because we had to speak in Korean to each other because I wasn't speaking English. Like this whole time we somehow gestured and figured out how we speak to one another. The work became about these interactions. Thank you. That's so helpful. Um, so our next question um, is, um this is again a kind of multiple multiply pronged question um and i'm going to combine one from um jorge who says what is one of the most important things that you learned about yourself through these experiences jesus says um asks during your 90 days in south korea what moments were you grateful to experience so apart from the trauma and difficulties what were some of the positive mm -hmm. aspects of those 90 days and stanley asks was there any point where you had to break your process of trans um and if so what was the situation that caused it so maybe those uh, the good, the bad, and then the the ugly break. Maybe. Mm -hmm. What was the first question? One more time. Um, the first was, um, what was one of the most important things that you learned about yourself through these experiences? Mm, okay. So you've talked a little bit about the, like some some of the trauma. The second part is then also what were some of the positive um, things? I, I think those two are actually quite related. Mm -hmm. And then a question about like what happens. You know, was there ever an experience where you had to um, break out of this contract with yourself? Hmm. I have to try to recall what happened. It was, it, it's kind of a blur, I have to say. I conducted it, I believe it was, it was, it was cold. I was not prepared for the weather. I was there. I'm trying to just like place it in my mind. Um, I was there also for the, the New Year's. Okay. I think what I couldn't, I couldn't imagine. I didn't, I had so much, I think I had so much anxiety um, that I didn't have with the German project which is just really revealing about my psychological state. If you watched the halfway point, you can see when I totally break down. I think I'd been doing the project at the 45 day mark. Um, I had just taken an exam exam and I just freaked. It was like I, something that I thought I was breaking but I managed to get through it and I kept doing the project. I think I had no idea how strong I could be. I had no idea I could study like that. <laughs> As I said before, I was like, I didn't have a tiger mom. So I never studied like that. I mean, it was just, I was in a classroom. This is another thing that's quite funny is I was in this classroom of almost all Chinese students. And there was one other student who was from Thailand, but he could speak Chinese. And I remember being really angry all the time because these little whippersnappers, they could learn Korean so fast because, you know, Korean is often, there's a lot of vocabulary that's based off of um, Chinese characters. And they would speak, they would constantly speak to each other in Chinese. And so I was like, really, I was really angry. I mean, I kept it inside, but I was really angry. Um, but it was hard. It was like, I think it was one of the most difficult challenges that I did to myself. You know, this is another thing that I think about is like, I put myself in the language prison, right? Just like I did the German speaking project as well. The same parameters, but the Korean one was somehow, there was more at stake. 
And when I first started the project, I had not made the decision about whether or not I was going to recover the citizenship that was not in the contract. That was not one of um, my endeavors at that time. I had decided to do it towards the middle of the project. And I think it was because it was so challenging and that I, I felt like if I'm going to persevere, then I have to have, there has to be some other symbolic gesture that I am going for that, you know, somehow there has to be like a means to the end. Um, so I was really grateful to have done it because I was making the choice myself. Like it was my choice to recover. I didn't have to. Um, and if I were to ever, you know, give up that citizenship, it would be my decision to give it up. I think that was also really important to me. So then did I break, did I ever break the process? Okay, so I will give you a little, um, how do you guys say, like I will admit something. That was that it's in the contract, but it's not so obvious in the piece. But I actually said that I could speak in German. So no, I actually did not speak English for 90 days, but I did speak German. And the reason why is, you know, German is first of all, like not my first language. So it's also like a struggle second language for me. But my partner was very um, concerned that I would be gone for three months and I wouldn't be able to speak to him. And so we decided that that would be permitted as long as I don't speak in English to speak to him, I can speak in German. And I do have to say, I think that gave me a little bit of relief. Fantastic. Um, thank you for sharing that. So I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, we have another question that asks, can you elaborate on your process on reclaiming your transracial identity and particularly as it relates to or differs from trans identities? Um, and I think this means, you know, the way we typically hear this word transgender. So um, you spoke a little bit about this, but there's a question about asking for more elaboration on this. Mm -hmm. Sure. So it's interesting that somehow a lot of people who had jumped in on the criticism towards Rachel Dolezal had no idea that this word was actually a common word in the transracial adopted community. And it's interesting that transgender when we think of trans, like we think of transgender people. And I think one of the reasons why I was also interesting, interested in using this term specifically for my project was to also say, hey, actually this word also exists in our community and we don't want it to be connected to or affiliated with this type of cultural appropriation that's going on with Rachel Dolezal claiming, co-opting our word for her purposes. Um, transracial in the sense of, I think, feeling often, especially as a child, I think, because we're so sheltered, you know, when we're children, especially if we end up growing up in a majority, you know, you're of European descent, like family or neighborhood. Uh, many of us may not feel like we are even people of color, you know, or, or Asian. Um, my experience, I will say, was a little bit different because uh, I grew up in Detroit and, you know, Detroit is actually a majority African-American um, population. And I grew up right outside the city, which was also quite mixed, but my direct family and, you know, the high school that I went to was majority white. But I was always really aware of my sort of in-between status of like not being white, but not being black, like kind of my identity as an Asian person wasn't really discussed. But I knew that I was different because, as I said before, like I got teased a lot and I had a lot of racial um, racist encounters 
when I was going to school on the bus. Um, not particularly like with my classmates, but with like people who didn't know me or, or people from other schools or from, you know, other grades. And so the, there was a lot of racial tension, I would say, in general in Detroit, and it was quite palpable. And so I sort of knew that I was not white. I wanted to be white, but I wasn't white. Um, but the term transracial, I think for many adopted people means that, you know, you grow up in a family of a different race and often a different culture. And so maybe the, the way that you feel on the inside is not necessarily the way that people see you from the outside. And so when people see you, they have certain expectations and they treat you in certain ways, which is very similar, I think, to, you know, transgender experience where you feel a certain way on the inside, but that's not how your gender is performed on the outside. And when I first started hearing um, about uh, people's personal experiences uh, transitioning, or even, you know, as I said, like in the talk, like passing or coming out, I just felt really compelled by that because I thought that is my experience, you know, completely different situation. But again, this, this feeling of feeling displaced or feeling like you don't belong. I think that those are those, those really strong emotions that connect these these differing experiences. Um, yeah. So I don't know if there's a follow-up question, maybe. I think we have time for one more. Um, and this question is from Hermony, um, who asks, um, Hermony asks, what backlash have you faced in reaction to your artwork and how do you deal with it, especially during the start of your career being Asian American and a woman? Hmm. Backlash. I mean, another way to, to ask us is, is, have you experienced black backlash? Well, I'm thinking about I mean, maybe backlash is like too strong of a word, but I have, I have had a lot of resistance to certain works that I've made. Um, I think sometimes, and this has probably changed, but when I was first making work, especially about identity and showing it in certain situations, I think a lot of parents that had adopted children felt very uneasy about the kinds of works that I was making as well as other people that I know who are adopted artists. I think they felt like their position as parents was being challenged. Um, I mean, but of course that's not my main audience. So those would, those types of resistance would that type of resistance would really only happen when I was specifically invited to be involved in an exhibition where adopted Korean artists were showing, you know, together in a group show um, for perhaps an event that dealt with um, the adopt the adoptive community, you know, which means uh, people who are adopted, um, parents, you know, doctors and, you know, activists and scholars who would, might come to some of those events. So I do remember having some very uncomfortable questioning and uh, difficult conversations. There was a tendency for a really long time. And as I also talked about from the Korean side of things is that, you know, adopted people are often seen as being helpless children. Like there's sort of a stigma, I think, around this idea because we've been kept in the dark about a lot of things. I mean, not only the idea of that we don't know the language and the culture, but we've also been kept in the dark um, often about even just our origins. Like we often don't have a right to, to look at um, documents uh, regarding, you know, what happened in our, our adoption process. I, I think that 
of course, it's also not just a specific to international adoption. That's also a problem that exists in this country where um, the, the child is a piece of property that doesn't have the same legal rights as, you know, the original parents or the birth parents. And, you know, personally, I think knowing where you're from is, is a human right. Um, and now, of course, um, the, this whole like DNA, uh, phenomenon is going to completely change things because now adoption agencies cannot keep necessarily keep the information from us. Like they don't have all the authority specifically in, in our cases. And I know a lot of people that have been able to, to meet their biological relatives through, you know, these DNA banks that are sort of popping up all over the place. There's actually quite a few of them as well in Korea. You know, I just will also mention one other thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately is um, because I think these children are really coming of age. I mean, they've become adults now is, is people who have been conceived by, by donor, um, by donor, basically donor DNA. And I think about their conundrum because they often, they, they don't have a right to those records. And I think that our paths, people who have been adopted, especially international, because it's so much further away, it's so much harder to get the information and their paths and our, the topics that are important to us they are starting to really inform each other. And I think there's going to be a lot of um, exchange that's going to be happening, um, if not already so, like in the next decade. Kate, hey, thank you so much. That is maybe the perfect note on which to end thinking about future work to be done. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Um, we are really just honored to present this exhibition at the New Media Arts Space. People um, in the audience, thank you so much for all of your questions and for, um, for your attention this evening. And I hope that if you have not already had a chance to check out the exhibition, you will do so. Um, it's at newmediaartspace.info. Kate, thank you so much. Thank you. I had a great time. <laughs>